I'm Curtis Robb, I'm the clinical lecturer here at the Royal Orthopaedic Hospital and I'm now going to show you an examination of the hands. This follows the normal pattern of look, feel, move, but the hands should not be considered alone. It is part of the upper limb and should be considered in conjunction with the neck, the shoulder, the elbow and the wrist. Having screened the neck and the shoulder, I would begin at the elbow. I look for any signs of psoriasis or rheumatoid nodules. I would then move on to the hands. I would begin by assessing from proximal to distal, looking at the dorsal aspect and then moving on to the volar aspect of the hand. Look for any deformity at the wrist the metacarpophalangeal joints, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. I also look for any scars, the condition of the nails, particularly for pitting and psoriasis, for any soft tissue swelling, for signs of a boutonnier deformity where there is flexion at the proximal interphalangeal joint and hyperextension at the distal interphalangeal joint, a swan neck deformity where there can be hyperextension deformity of the proximal interphalangeal joint and flexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. For signs on the velar aspect of Jupitron's disease. For shouldering at the first carpometacarpal joint and wasting of the thena, the hyperthena or the intrinsic area of the dorsum of the hand. We will now move on to feel and we will go as usual from proximal to distal. I assess the wrist first, feeling the radial styloid and the ulnar styloid. Between these is the wrist joint. Here is the triangular fibrocartilaginous complex and distal to Lister's tubercle at this area is the scapholunate joint. I also assess the first dorsal compartment which is here at the site of de Quervain's tenosynovitis and this is the area of tenderness where should they have tenosynovitis pain will be elicited. I also feel at the first carpometacarpal joint for signs of osteoarthritis. I feel the metacarpophalangeal joints, both in the fingers and in the thumb, the proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. I also feel for the flexor tendons in the fingers. These areas may show signs of pain if there is a tenosynovitis, and sometimes you can feel a nodule at the site of the A1 pulley, which is at the distal transverse crease of the palm. I would then do a quick screen of movement of the wrist and the hand. Then get the patient to perform various maneuvers and copy myself. You put your wrist in this position, obtain full dorsiflexion, assess wrist flexion, then get the patient to put their arms by their side and assess supination and pronation. Then assess radial and ulnar deviation. This is radial deviation and ulnar deviation. The patient to make a clenched fist and an open arm, an open palm, and this will give you an idea of the cadence of the fingers. I would then, having assessed this, move on to more specialised tests. Having found where you think the pathology is, you should then direct your examination to either a neurological, a tendon, or a functional assessment. We'll start with the neurological assessment. Starting then, with the median nerve distribution. This is located on the radial border of the hand in the thumb, 
the index and the middle finger. You should therefore check sensation in the autonomous zone, which is the sensation over the tip of the index finger. You then assess power by assessing abductor pollicis brevis. You get the patient to keep their thumb abducted in this position and check the power of abductor pollicis brevis. You should then perform a direct compression test over the carpal tunnel. Any pain and pathology in the carpal tunnel will reproduce symptoms on the radial border of the hand by direct compression over the carpal tunnel area. This can be assessed again by Tinnell's test, tapping over the carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel syndrome can also be assessed by Phelan's test, maintaining the elbow in an extended position with wrist flexion will increase pressure in the carpal tunnel and patient symptoms will be reproduced again in the median nerve distribution of the hand and this position should be maintained for one minute uh, to ensure that there either is or is no pathology in the carpal tunnel. The anterior interosseous nerve can be assessed by getting the patient to perform an O sign, ensuring that there is flexion at the flexor pollicis longus, the interphalangeal joint of the thumb, and the flexor digitorum profundus is, is working by providing flexion at the distal interphalangeal joint. If there is an anterior interosseous nerve palsy, the patient will perform a Kylo Nevin sign, indicated uh, by lack of flexion in the, dist in the distal phalanx of the finger and the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. The ulnar nerve can be assessed, again starting with sensation in the autonomous zone, little finger. Power can be assessed by the intrinsic muscles of the hand and you get the patient to abduct the fingers and you provide resistance and ensure that the abductors of the hand are working, indicating that there is no pathology in the ulnar nerve. Froman's test can be assessed by asking the patient to hold a piece of card between their thumb and their hand. And the patient's arm supinated. Paper should be slid between the thumb and the hand. And the patient asks to keep the paper in this position. The ability to do so indicates that the adductor policies is working. Should this be incompetent, the patient will demonstrate flexion of the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and the paper is retained by this means, indicating that the ulnar nerve is injured in some way. You should also assess the ulnar nerve again, working from proximal to distal. It should be assessed at the elbow by direct compression at the cubital tunnel behind the medial epicondyle. Tinnell's test can be used here to assess for tingling in the distal ulnar nerve distribution. You should also perform a flexion test at the elbow, which will compress the ulnar nerve, and you should maintain the wrist in extension uh, to ensure that the carpal tunnel syndrome symptoms aren't reproduced. And if this is positive, the patient will get tingling in the ulnar nerve distribution of the forearm and the hand. Distally, the ulnar nerve can be injured in the Guyon's canal. This is located between the hook of the hamate and the pesi form. Again, you can perform a direct compression test to reproduce pain and symptoms in the ulnar nerve distribution of the fingers or a Tinnell's test in this area. A high or a low ulnar nerve lesion can be elicited by assessing the sensation at the dorsum of the hand. The dorsal cutaneous branch is given off five centimeters proximal to the wrist. Therefore, if the injury occurs to the ulnar nerve at the wrist, the sensation to the dorsal ulnar aspect of the hand will be intact. The radial nerve can be assessed by the sensation to the first dorsal web space and the power by resisted wrist extension. 
feeling for the tone in the forearm. Function of the hand is assessed by a variety of different grips. A fine grip is assessed by asking the patient to pick up a coin. Tripod grip by asking them to write with a pen. Key pinch by asking them to use a key to open a door. Power grip by asking them to squeeze your fingers. And a hook grip by asking them to make a hook position and assess their degree of power. We then move on to a tendon assessment. I would advise checking each tendon in isolation. The thumb can be assessed by abductor pollicis longus, placing the thumb in abduction, resist and providing resistance. Abductor pollicis brevis by providing resistance in the proximal phalanx. Extensor pollicis longus by asking the patient to lift their thumb off, off the table. Extensor pollicis brevis by, asking, by resisting the patient uh, at the proximal phalanx and asking them again to, res to provide extension. And flexor pollicis longus by asking them to flex at the interphalangeal joint of the thumb. The fingers can be assessed by examining the interossei. If you ask the patient to spread the fingers and stop you from pushing them together, the flexor digitorum profundus should be examined by holding the proximal interphalangeal joint in extension and asking them to bend the distal interphalangeal joint for each finger. And the flexor digitorum superficialis tendon can be assessed by holding the other fingers in extension and asking them to bend at the proximal interphalangeal joint. The extensors of each finger can be assessed by asking the patient to hold their fingers in extension. You can also see the extensors working nicely. The wrist extensors can be assessed by asking the patient to extend at the wrist, keeping their hand in a clench position, and extend at the wrist, and resist forward flexion of the wrist while palpating extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis in the second dorsal compartment of the wrist. The extensor carpi ulnaris can be evaluated by asking the patient to resist wrist extension with ulnar deviation. The patient again in wrist extension, if you dorsiflex at the wrist, and place it in ulnar deviation, and then get the patient to keep their arm in that position, palpating again over the extensor carpi ulnaris, ensuring it's intact. We can then move on to more specialised tests. Finkelstein's test can be assessed by palpating for pain over the first dorsal compartment, getting the patient to place their, their thumb in the, in the palm, and moving the wrist into ulnar deviation. And this will reproduce the patient's symptoms in the first dorsal compartment, where they may have a diagnosis of de Quervain's tenovaginitis. Osteoarthritis at the first carpometacarpal joint can be elicited by the axial grind test. This is where the carpus is stabilized and the metacarpal of the thumb is axially ground against the trapezium and this will elicit pain if there is first carpometacarpal osteoarthritis. The scapholunate ligament can be assessed by Kirk Watson's test. If you have the patient with a flexed elbow, you palpate the pole of the scaphoid, which is just distal to ECR. You then place your finger over the 
proximal pole of the scaphoid and your thumb over the dorsum of the wrist and you then deviate from the ulna to the radial border of the hand and you'll feel the proximal pole of the scaphoid at the dorsum of the hand snapping back should the scapholunate ligament be incompetent. Allen's test can be assessed by including the radial and the ulnar arteries and asking the patient to make a fist twice. This empties the blood from the hand. You then release the ulnar artery and you should see the blood return to the hand. You then put your pressure over the ulnar artery again. Ask the patient to make a fist twice. Release the radial artery and again you should see the flow of blood back to the hand. If this is incompetent in any way, it may demonstrate that there is insufficient blood supply from either the radial or the ulnar artery to the hand.